Amen. That is a wonderful hope. We get to turn our attention now in the study of God's Word to the book of Romans. I know last week I must apologize because it was a bit of a teaser, just generally looking, hovering over the text. Now we get to begin to get closer into diving into the text, but only a step closer. Uh, this is a uh, so much just to set our frame of thinking before we jump into this marvelous text. Let me just begin this morning by reading verses 1 through 7. Here's what Paul writes to the church in Rome. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called us saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a, an amazing introduction to this study. And in fact, in these seven verses here, Paul touches on seven theological truths. He touches on the Trinity, he touches on Christology, he touches on pneumatology, he touches on apostleship, sanctification, resurrection, and the faith. Which means that by the time we finish these first seven verses, it's going to feel like we have been on a theological marathon and we've only gotten in the, into the introduction. Paul is here overflowing with joy. And I want to draw this out for you this morning. Paul here begins to unfold here the significance of the Word of God and particularly sound doctrine. And in looking at these seven verses, we get good insight into the heart of the Apostle Paul. Now, as I told you, Paul wrote this letter from Corinth. He's at the end of his third missionary journey. He is anticipating what he is going to do next. He is going to leave here from Corinth and head to Jerusalem and minister to the churches in Jerusalem by taking them a love offering from the Gentile churches. And as he delivers that love offering to Jerusalem to minister to the apostles and to the church there in Jerusalem, he is anticipating what his next steps are, and he desires to go on to Rome. He desires to head from Rome, then on to Spain, and to continue pushing the gospel message to the outer edges of the world. And he believes that in sending this letter to the church in Rome, he is going to prepare the church for his arrival. So that this letter here acts as Paul's resume, Paul's philosophy of ministry. It establishes his convictions, his theology. He's in essence saying to the church in Rome, you can trust me and you can get behind me because this is what I believe and this is what I teach. You ought to get behind what I am doing because of what I am teaching, and here's what I teach. And then he unfolds the writing of the letter to the Romans. Sixteen chapters filled with profound theology and implications for us. Sixteen chapters that would add incredible encouragement to the church there who is in Rome. Now, what I find rather interesting is that what Paul demonstrates here that when he writes to this church, you know, the temptation today would say, well, just send them something light, you know, just kind of a, a nice soft letter to kind of be an introduction. And then when you come, you give them all the heavy canons of, of sound theology. That's not what Paul does here. 
Paul just opens up with a bang. He opens up, even the first seven verses here, opens up with profound theology that then continues through the rest of the book. That is a sense where he recognizes this very truth, that theology unites God's people together. Sound theology and sound doctrine actually brings the church of God together. It doesn't divide God's people. It actually unites God's people. This very theme is, if you want to study later, you can pick up in Ephesians chapter 4 and look particularly at verses 3 and 13, and you will see there Paul talk about the unity of the faith, describing there in that context even how various gifts are given to the body for the unity of the faith, and those gifts give to the church sound doctrine and instruction. Point being all of this, that if Paul is going to find a ministry harmony and unity with the church in Rome, he is going to lay out for the church in Rome his convictions, his doctrines, that they'll either get behind and embrace or they will be separated from. But I also believe that Paul writing to the church in Rome is writing out of a deep awareness of the normal trials and difficulties that the church would face. Again, if Paul is writing at his third missionary journey, he's writing after he has already planted many churches. He's writing after he has already ministered with to churches that have different ministry trials and difficulties. He is, after all, writing after he has dealt with the Corinthians and they're pulling away from the, him. He is writing after he has addressed even Peter and Peter's own slipping in his gospel that is recorded for in the book of Galatians. Paul knows what it's like to have ministry conflict. He knows what it's like to have the Judaizers come in and try to undermine his message. He knows what it's like to be, to have to confront doctrinal error and doctrinal drift within the church and people pull away. He knows the struggles that the human heart has in holding people accountable to the truth. He's dealt with the Corinthians and their unwillingness to confront sin in their midst. So out of all of that personal experience, Paul then writes to those in Rome, preparing them, and I believe in some sense, exposing within the church those who are going to embrace the true gospel and those who are going to pull away. By the way... Those who were in Rome likely were Gentiles and Jewish converts there. It was a mixed church. You can see that as you work your way through the book of Romans. At times, Paul is uh, directing his message to Gentiles directly, and there are times where Paul is directing his message to Jews. So he goes back and forth in his audience as he's addressing them. So clearly, in this particular case, Paul is writing this to prepare the church for the unique vulnerabilities that they might face. Particularly, if you were a Jew, the vulnerability would be to trust in your Jewish heritage over and against trusting in the gospel of God. Paul uproots that here in this. But before we get into that, let's just establish what's happening here in verses 1 through 7. 1 through 7 is an introduction, a typical Roman introduction, an introduction that would be given. That's the genre. So that in one sense, we can simply say verses 1 through 7 is about Paul's greeting to a church that he hasn't been to. He identifies himself, Paul. He identifies the audience, verse 7, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. And he gives a greeting Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in one sense, this genre is his introduction, his greeting. Genre is important. We interpret genre like we, uh, if we interpret like an introduction the same way we interpret an epistle, we would get ourselves in trouble. So we won't want to necessarily treat this like we would treat the middle part of Paul's letter. There's differences in how we handle uh, prophecy versus maybe a parable or something else. Here, this is an introduction. So that we're not necessarily going to develop our full systematic theology from this introduction. But what we can learn from this introduction is we can learn something about the Apostle Paul himself. 
And that's what I want to draw your attention to this morning because we learn a lot about God's minister. To help you see this, let me show you how Paul introduced himself in his other letters. Turn over to the book of 1 Corinthians. I really want you to see the contrast of Paul's introductions, his introductory comments. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul says this, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who are in every place, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the same formula. Paul, the introduction of the author, the audience to the church of God, which is at Corinth, the greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You see the similar introduction, the apostle. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 3, or 1 and 2. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Two verses introducing the standard introduction. The author, the audience, and the greeting. Turn over to Galatians. Galatians is most like our introduction in Romans. Notice Galatians 1, 1 through 5. Paul says, again, Paul, the author, is an apostle not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me, the audience to the churches of Galatia, the greeting, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul does the same thing in Colossians. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. He continues on. He does this in Philippians. He does the same thing in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Turn over to 1 Timothy. I'll show you one more time in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He says the same thing in 2 Timothy, but you're getting the idea. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. The point is this, that Paul has many very tidy and short introductions, and this is the formula. Introduce himself, introduce the audience to whom he is writing, and then give a greeting. Now turn back to Romans and look again at what happens in Romans chapter 1. From verse 1 through 7, first of all, we observe now he has now doubled the average size of his introduction. And second of all, look at the profound riches that come out of it again. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who is declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, 
called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This introduction, this, these seven verses give us profound insight into the apostle himself. As you just see the backdrop of his normal introductory remarks, you can tell there's a lot on the apostle's heart and mind. There's a lot that he's concerned about. And it just exudes out even in these opening verses here. Because in one sense, we, did, we could call this simply a greeting. In another sense, this is informing us into the heart and mind of the apostle himself. And that's what I want to draw your attention to, to show you the riches of the Apostle Paul, how he viewed himself and how he viewed his ministry. Some have said in these opening seven verses that this is a micro gospel that Paul is preaching here, and that could be the case. Others have said that Paul is so filled with exuberance and excitement that he can't contain himself and he just kept writing and writing. Uh, possibly, I don't know, I wasn't there, uh, but there's certainly some excitement there that Paul has. What is clear is this, that Paul is pondering his own work. He is pondering his own message, and it is coming out as he is writing this introduction. Paul is giving explanation as to his own ministry. And in giving explanation to his own ministry, he is briefly showing the Romans what he is about to talk about in the rest of this gospel. He is going to explain to them the gospel, what it is. He is going to unite them around the truth. And we're going to see that. Clearly, the book of Romans is about the gospel. It's where Paul starts. Notice in verse 1. He is called as an, as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. From verse 1 on, Paul grabs this theme of the gospel and he runs with it. Notice down in verse 9, he picks it up again. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son... Jump down to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Chapter 2 and verse 16. On the, the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Jump over to chapter 10. He brings this out again. This term gospel is used. Though your translation may have it as something other like glad tidings or something else. Here, uh, my translation translates in verse uh, 15 and 16 of Romans chapter 10 says this. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That is the word for gospel in the Greek, Evangelion, The good news of good things. Verse 16, however, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Twice here again, Paul is referring to the gospel, particularly a gospel from an Old Testament emphasis. But again, the gospel is central. And in this particular context, he talks about the sending of messengers to preach the message of salvation. Chapter 11 and verse 28, the word gospel is used again. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. And so what he is talking here about the conflict with the Jew in the gospel. Chapter 15, a couple more times, he brings out this gospel in Emphasis chapter 15 and verse 16 says this. He is to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, notice, the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable. Jump down to verse 19. 
Again, he says, in the power of signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and around about as far as Elyricum, I shall fully preach the gospel of Christ. Verse 20, and thus I aspired to preach the gospel. Here's the emphasis. Twice Paul speaks of the gospel of God. Twice he speaks of my gospel. Twice he speaks of the gospel of the Son of God or of Christ. And five times he refers to just the gospel or the glad tidings or good news. Point being is that Paul is going to explain to the Romans not only what the gospel is, but what the gospel does. Here, back in Romans chapter 1, he begins, even in his introduction, to get to this very theme of the gospel. And as I said, this isn't where we're going to launch to develop our theology, but this is where we're going to dive deep into understanding the heart of this man of God, this minister, and how God used this minister to build the church. And there's one particular phrase that just kept sticking out to me that I want to draw your attention to. And that phrase is at the end of verse 1, the phrase, the gospel of God. Particularly the modifier there after the word gospel, the genitive modifier of God, theu. That is, this is emphasizing the source the source of the gospel. It is God. Paul has been set apart for God's gospel, the gospel which comes from God. That is his emphasis. And we'll see more of this as we work our way through these seven verses, but for the moment, just trust me and follow along, and let me point out the significance of this particular statement, the gospel of God. Because... Uh, by the modifier, it's emphasizing its source. It reminds me of this, that I believe that in many cases, the gospel has fallen on low times. Let me ask you this. How do you view the gospel? What is your viewpoint of it? Is the gospel something that is shapeable? Something that you get to work at and you can develop and you can adjust and keep reshaping it? Many, I believe, are viewing the gospel that very way. Like the gospel is uh, something that is like putty. That we get to reshape the gospel. But I believe that when we do that, we are actually having a low view of the gospel. Someone may say to me at this point, we don't have a low view of the gospel. We love to talk about the gospel. We love to talk about the, the gospel. And I believe the church does love to talk about good news. The church loves good news. Everybody loves good news. In fact, if you came and confronted me, I'd want you to give me good news first, then confront me, and then finish with some good news so that you give the bad news in kind of a good news sandwich. I mean, that's what I want. We want good news regularly. And we're regularly talking about good news. The problem is that we have believed that the good news of God can be changed, can be adapted, can be repackaged, and in doing that, we can remain faithful. And I think that's where the problem lies. And that problem is revealed here by the Apostle Paul himself. Friends, this has become evident if we just look out and look around what's happening. In the early 2000s, this very idea that the gospel can be repackaged and redefined came out in the Young, Restless, and Reformed group in the years, in the early 2000s. That group believed that we can adapt the gospel, we can change it, and in changing it, we can become more missional, whatever that means. I'm not quite sure it's fully clear yet what that means per se, other than to say we can adapt the message to have a new mission for the church. Or men like Bill Hybels and Robert Schuller have hijacked the gospel for big business. We can reach more and draw more people in. I think this evidence is the gospel has fallen on hard times. Man, in his own wisdom, in his own understanding, 
redefines the gospel, re-explains it, reinterprets it, and it happens at a rapid pace. But I want to point out here, Paul recognized this. He is set apart for the gospel of God. Now think about this for a moment. If the gospel comes from God, why would it need to be changed? Does God need to be changed? Is God different from one generation to the next generation? Or is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? He's the same. The gospel then, if it is the gospel of God, is a gospel that is consistent from generation to generation. Why? Because God himself is consistent from generation to generation. And the gospel, if it comes from God, addresses the heart problem that God sees. But that's not where we're at. Today, there are different gospels. Let me just give you a few that are out there. There's the gospel of felt needs. This gospel comes something like this. Do you feel bad about yourself? Do you have a low view of yourself? Do you see yourself as worthless, hopeless, helpless, that you are nothing, that you feel so bad about yourself that there's no value in you? Well, remember this, the gospel of felt need says, God loved you so much and thought of you as so valuable that he sent his son to die for you because he saw value in you when you did not see value in yourself. This is the Joel Osteen gospel. The, the gospel of rescuing man from his low view of himself. We won't talk about sin. We won't talk about anything that, that man has done wrong. We will only talk about those positive attributes because after all, that's why God came and rescued you. He saw those when you didn't see them in you. Or maybe there's a different flavor of the gospel. Maybe you want a more edgy gospel. You want to reach a more edgy group. There is the edgy gospel as well. This edgy gospel is going to reach the biker gangs and the millennials. I don't know why they mix together, but they're both edgy groups. And those edgy groups need to be reached in a unique way. And so you have an edgy gospel. By the way, this one got me in trouble in the first service, so here we go again. <laughs> the edgy gospel says we're going to meet, we're going to reach the fringe groups. And we're going to reach the fringe groups by talking like them. We're going to reach the fringe groups by wearing the same clothes that they wear. We're going to demonstrate the pent-up frustration that that edgy group has. And we're going to identify with it. And when we identify with that fringe group, we'll win them over for Jesus. After all, Jesus was the first bartender in the New Testament. When he turned water into wine, we could do the same thing. So they say... These ministers come speaking with expletives and speaking frankly about marriage intimacy, trying to be too edgy so that they can enter into that group and have some kind of credibility. This is the gospel of Mark Driscoll. But there are other gospels. There's the gospel of greed or the gospel that appeals to man's vulnerabilities are you tired of being poor? Are you tired of not being able to pay your bills, not having enough? Are you a bit frustrated that somebody has a better life than you? They have a better house, a better car, better clothing. They can go on better vacations. Well, God wants to bless you. All he needs is your faith. If you have enough faith to give to the church more, then God will bless you more. This is the gospel of greed. This is the Kenneth Copeland gospel. You keep giving in faith and God will give back more to you. Or another gospel, those of the free grace movement today, those who are frustrated with the guilt of sin, those who are frustrated with obedience, frustrated with striving to, to be right, tired of trying to obey and always failing, this gospel of free grace says stop trying. Don't care about it anymore. God has handled all those things already. You're free to live in every way and in your freedom because Christ accomplished it all. You will just respond rightly. Or 
the more popular gospel in the last couple of years is the social gospel. Social gospel says the problem is man's human suffering. The problem today is that there is suffering in the world. There's an inequality. The social gospel says we need to handle all the inequality in the world. All of the people who are suffering, blacks and Asians and gays and transsexuals and all, all those who are suffering in this world need to have equal rights and equal opportunities. All are equal except unless you're white, conservative, monogamous and heterosexual, well then you're the problem. Social gospel today says that the problem is that we don't have equality. Friends, these are gospels being sent out and pushed out. These are gospels being preached and filling churches. And all of these gospels have one thing in common. They are not the gospel of God. Now, I don't believe the answer is for me to give you the Mark Rag gospel. If you left here with a Mark Rag gospel, I would be equally as wrong. The answer is to give you the gospel of God. The answer is to explain the message which has come from God. And guess what? I know where it's found. It's found in the word of God. Because that's what Paul says he delivers. He has been set apart for the gospel of God. His ministry is to minister the gospel of God. Friends, this is significant for us. We do not need to reinvent the gospel. God didn't need us to come along and to give gospel new life. He didn't need us to give gospel new energy and new purpose. He has already defined that when he gave his message, his timeless message. His message is eternal and accomplishes the most important purposes. His message will actually transform us. I mean, think about it today. When those come along and present a new gospel, which is really not the gospel, while promising to direct us to God, if it changes the message of God, it actually directs us away from God. And that's the subtle danger of it all. That somebody can come along preaching a message, claiming to be of God, and yet it not be God's message, and therefore lead people astray. There's so many dangers here. So many potholes that we could fall in easily. It would be easy for us even to pick some of our favorite doctrines and say, well, that's what the gospel is about. The gospel is about our favorite doctrine. I think about forgiveness, for example. If anyone loves forgiveness, I far more. I love the doctrine, but the gospel is worth and about so much more than just forgiveness. For the, the Bible has regularly talked about forgiveness from the Old Testament through the New. What is emphasized here, Paul is going to lay out, is the gospel of God. Let me just give you, quickly, a couple of truths that we're going to learn. Fifteen of them, real fast. <laughs> that we're going to learn about the gospel when we go through this book. We learn the source. The source is God himself. If someone comes with a gospel other than the source of God, it can immediately be rejected. Verse 1 tells us that. This is the gospel of God. The gospel is about God's righteousness and the application of that righteousness to man. Chapters 3 and 4 describes that. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. The true gospel, God's gospel, is about Jesus Christ. And God's gospel is taught by his ministers. Chapter 1, verse 1. And God's gospel brings reconciliation between God and man. That is man's greatest need, to be reconciled to God again. Does God bring peace? Does he bring restoration? Does he calm the heart that's filled with anxiety? Absolutely. Those things are accomplished, but they're accomplished in God, not apart from him. The gospel is received by faith, chapter 4 says. The gospel is unchanging and accomplishes his eternal purposes. The gospel, God's gospel, transforms everyone who embraces it. And God's gospel reveals God's eternal attributes of mercy and love. And God's gospel deals with our corruption and guilt, 
And God's gospel sanctifies us. And God's gospel unites the universal body of Christ together. And God's gospel is consistent with his covenant promises, fulfilling what God has said in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. God's gospel reveals his glory most significantly is this, that God's gospel originates with God and is managed by God himself. That is to say, the entire Godhead is at work in his gospel. We see that here in chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are at work in the giving and working of the gospel. Which I would say this then. If the whole Godhead is behind the, God, uh, the gospel of God, then why would we look somewhere else? Why would we be entertained by anything else? If I have a gospel that has its source in God himself, and he is at work in it, then there's nowhere else we need to look. For nothing else comes with the power of God than his own gospel. That's what our hope is. That as we work our way through this marvelous book, not only will we learn of the gospel of God, but we will learn of God's active work in his message. Now these are introductions. How do I know that? Those truths are evident because that's what's unfolded in these seven verses. Let me give you the outline. We're not going to cover the outline today. We'll cover the outline next week. But this, here's the outline to this book. We learn of the gospel messenger or the, and the gospel manager. Or to put it in more kind of higher terms, it would be this. We have the gospel courier and the gospel curator. The gospel courier and the gospel curator. And under the gospel courier, we learn three things. The gospel courier's qualifications, verse 1. The gospel courier's consistency, verse 2. And the gospel courier's content, verse 3 and 4. And then we see the gospel curator from the end of verse 4. And we see three things about him. The gospel curator's investment, verse 5a. The gospel curator's intention, verse 5b. And the gospel curator's inclusion, verses 6 and 7. Those walk us through this entire section. You see two people. This whole section, verses 1 through 7, is about two people. The Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is called to ministry, Paul, and the one who enables it, enacts it, manages it, operates it, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is what the first seven verses is all about. So let me just set up Paul who he is. And just close us this morning with looking at the gospel courier himself. And then next week we'll jump into our outline. Notice Paul, as he says there in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul is the writer of this book. Just a couple things I want to point out about Paul himself. Paul, born in Tarsus, you know, as Acts 22 says, is born in Tarsus, to be a resident of Tarsus, you had to be very affluent. There was a historical studies found that a resident of Tarsus would have to pay in annual taxes the amount of a day laborer's wages for a year. So if you were a laborer, just a day laborer, and you worked for an entire year, you would make just enough to pay for the taxes to live in Tarsus. Which demonstrated clearly for Paul to be of Tarsus, he had to come from an affluent family. Maybe he didn't necessarily have an affluent lifestyle, but nonetheless he had come from an affluent family to live in Tarsus and to have that credibility to his name. That he was, that's what made him a Roman, and that's what guarded him with Roman law. He was of Tarsus. But more than that, he was also of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as Philippians 3.5 says. He was also a very devout Jew. Likely, some have believed that he was from a family of Pharisees. 
he was converted. In his conversion, he was led to be uh, in the Pharisaic traditions. That's where his training came from, and he had the best of training. We know of Paul by his persecution of the church as Saul. When, when Saul had persecuted the early church because of his zeal, because he saw the way and he was against the church. He was going around from city to city to draw out Christians and have them stoned. You remember his conversion that while he was on the road to Damascus, that the Lord Jesus Christ came and called him from that work and called him into his ministry, converted him. After Paul's conversion, he then spent a couple of years there in Damascus waiting. He was interacting with the early church, interacting with Peter and other, Peter's and James. And he spent time there for a couple of years before he traveled back to Tarsus for further training. He was in Tarsus from 38 to 45 and spending time there working in tent making ministry or tent making skills. At the same time, it's likely that he was there learning from Jesus Christ himself. Say, how would I know that? If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul has an interesting discussion there. He says he speaks of a man who doesn't know whether in the body or out of the body, but somebody who saw the Lord Jesus Christ and heard from Jesus Christ himself. I believe that that is Paul referring to himself at that time, and he was receiving direct, regular, continual instruction from Jesus up until about A.D. 46, when Barnabas came along, grabs Paul, they head to Antioch, and there in Antioch, the Holy Spirit sets Barnabas and Paul aside to go on a missionary journey. And that's where then Paul's first missionary journey happens in about A.D. 47. Uh, during that time, Gentile churches are planted. You have the church in Galatia and others. They're planted during this time, and confusion starts in the church, to which Paul has to head back to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council. This is Acts chapter 15. In the Jerusalem Council, uh, they have a debate over these Gentile converts. Do they belong in the church? And what kind of rules should we put over them? And should we reintroduce them to the law? And you know the whole debate there in Acts chapter 15 about what it is that's proper for a Gentile Christian to do. To which then Paul is sent out on his second missionary journey in A.D. 48 and 49. That one ends. He begins his third missionary journey around A.D. 51. And by the time you come to the end of A.D. 57, 58, Paul has finished that third missionary journey and we pick up here in the book of Rome, Romans. All that to say that Paul has been on three missionary journeys founded numerous churches, wrote many letters, and he will still write more as he's sent to Rome and imprisoned. But in the writing of these letters, at this particular point, you have the Apostle Paul giving us now ministry perspective of what a man of God does in ministering to the church. So let me just point out, to draw us to a conclusion this morning, let me just point out this. Let us remember this, that when we come to the ministry, we do not come to the ministry with our own creativity and our own wisdom and understanding. We come as messengers of God. We come to do God's work, not our own. If there's anybody who had the opportunity to trust in himself and his own wisdom and understanding, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Came from a privileged home, likely in a affluent lifestyle, the finest education, the best religious pedigree, great religious zeal and commitment. And yet, as he said to the Philippians, he put no confidence in the flesh. So we read this morning in our scripture reading out of Philippians 3, 1 through 11, if there's anyone who could have put confidence in the flesh, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But he put no confidence in, flesh, in the flesh. He put his confidence in God. That he would know Christ and know his sufferings. Friends, that should be our mindset as well. That when we come to this work, 
We are simply messengers of God coming under his message, not our own. And I trust as we work our way through this example, then next week we'll start to unpack the messenger and the manager of the gospel, the gospel courier and the gospel curator. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that when we are tempted to be self-willed and self-seeking, when we're tempted to, to even change the message a little bit to be more fitting for our ear or our understanding, may we be immediately arrested by the words that Paul lays out here, that we are simply messengers set apart for this work. And may we have no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in ourselves, but our confidence be entirely in you. And may when we're tempted to go astray or to, to add to the message, may we come back to these marvelous truths and recognize we are simply seeking to be faithful servants of the Most High God to deliver your message to the whole world. So help us as we study through this book to understand the depths and the breadths of your message so that we can communicate it clearly to all. Thank you for this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we close together in song. A very appropriate song of response today. Hymn number 175, All I Have is Christ. This is indeed what Paul says. I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's sing of him now. Hymn number 175, All I Have is Christ. Amen.
pray. Lord, thank you for the mercy and privilege of sitting under your word. And we know that with that privilege, there comes the responsibility of believing it and submitting our wills to it in obedience. So help us to take care to listen and respond the way we ought, that the word would take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. As we depart, that you would grant us grace to trust and obey you in all things and to live lives that are consistent with this glorious gospel. In the name of Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. <laughs>